Okay, so this video is about the RTX 4070 Super. It's not a full review, that's on the main channel. This clip does something very different. It's all about looking at the current mid-range GPUs more holistically, using PlayStation 5 as a baseline and then seeing how a card like 4070 Super scales accordingly. So this is something different outside of standard benchmarks, which I think do a pretty poor job of taking into account stuff like DLSS or other features. And yes, there are use cases in looking at things other than ultra settings, which is what we're going to do right here. Uh, let's consider the AAA space at the moment. The primary target platform for developers seems to be PlayStation 5. That means that visual targets are defined by the capabilities of that machine. Developers are primed to ensure that game engines and performance are finely balanced for a good experience on that machine. And yeah, it's where we often find matches uh, with our own optimized settings. It's no coincidence there. So I did some experiments with a number of games, kicking off with Cyberpunk 2077. We talked about this uh, benchmark run in a recent video where I was able to transfer across CD Projekt Red's internal streaming tests from PC to console. First test, well, here we are looking at performance mode on the PlayStation 5. This uses dynamic resolution scaling, and we can reasonably assume that when the game can't hit 60 frames per second on the console, it's at minimum dynamic res, in this case, 1008p, upscaled to 1800p by FSR2. Attach the exact same settings to PC, and you have effectively twice the performance. Of course, you're more likely to use DLSS, or even DLSS 3 frame generation, and you can see the corresponding runs there. But obviously, at this point, PC hardware is on a whole different level, even in like-for-like -like comparisons. Phantom Liberty is heavier, and I was also keen to see how PC compared on match settings in an area where PS5 consistently failed to meet its performance target. 2160p output here, FSR2 quality mode, and here's how that worked out. In matched settings, 4070 Super offered a 2.21 times performance multiplier, rising to 2.3x when FSR2 quality mode was swapped out for its DLSS equivalent. That rises to 3.2x in frame rate terms when DLSS 3 frame generation kicks in. But remember, in that scenario, you are trading latency for more fluidity. Console comparisons are fine, but check out straight RT overdrive performance here on 4070 Super. Now, this is a world apart from the console experience, but it works well on this hardware. Again, I'm upscaling to 1800p on the left there, then using the GPU scaler to output to 2160p. DLSS performance mode, and we're in the mid 70s across all of my test clips. Base frame rates are in the 40s, so with the extra latency, you will feel a difference, but it works okay, especially on a gamepad. On the right, uh, we've upped the DLSS quality level to be on the balanced mode and dropped to a 1440p output resolution. I'll be doing that in a lot of my tests here because while I consider this class of card as fine for 4K gaming, many, uh, possibly a lot more, end users will be playing at 1440p instead. And here we're mostly in 100 frames per second territory. The classic travel spot, the Cherry Blossom Marketplace, shows things at their worst in the base Cyberpunk 2077. Still, the point is that while this is a mid-range card, um, you do have an entry point to higher-end experiences here, things that are simply just not possible whatsoever on a console. And that extends to Alan Wake 2, same deal really in our testing. We know the exact quality settings of the PS5's quality mode, which is capped at 30 FPS. Now, it's hard to find drops to that cap since it was patched, but here's an example I did find, a 2.17 times performance increase in matched settings on the RTX 4070 Super, rising to 2.31x when FSR2 balanced mode is swapped out with its DLSS equivalent. And yes, it's another DLSS 3 game, meaning a 3.1x frame rate increase over PlayStation 5. In effect, 4070 Super offers over twice the performance of the PS5 in these games, while DLSS increases both quality and frame rate. Uh, frame generation, again, you're trading latency for increased fluidity. Uh, path tracing at high resolutions on 4070 Super, it is viable and it looks astonishing, but make no mistake, this is super taxing stuff. I'm using console equivalent quality settings there, but then I'm adding Alex's optimized path tracing settings. This is a taxing area, 
but with frame generation active we're in the mid 70s when using DLSS performance mode to upscale to 1800p rising to around 90 fps on average dropping to 1440p with DLSS balance mode bit of a tricky one to assess because while both resolutions are totally viable and look excellent um, base frame rates in the 1800p mode can dip to circa 30 fps at worst and with frame gen in play 100 milliseconds of lag is observable in the stress points 1440p will feel better but ultimately 100 milliseconds may not be great but latency is kind of relative according to tom morgan's latest testing for the ps5 cloud service local lag from the console on playstation 5 in cyberpunk's performance mode which runs at 60 frames per second is you guessed it 100 milliseconds I haven't really seen too many complaints about that maybe it is just a joypad thing it is an inherently laggier device uh, but wait just a second here We've just talked about two of the top three best game graphics of 2023. So why not circle back and take a look at our overall winner? That'll be Avatar Frontiers of Pandora. I'm on high settings here, which is essentially the same as the PlayStation 5's 30 FPS quality mode, but there have been a couple of settings tweaks upwards for PCs high. This game is monstrously performant on PC, in my opinion. And without FSR 3 frame generation active here, we're getting exceptional results. 4K performance across this clip averages to 76 frames per second with DLSS balanced mode, rising to 90 FPS at 1440p in DLSS quality mode. An astonishingly good looking game with overhead to spare in cranking up settings still further. PlayStation 5 comparisons aren't easy to do owing to dynamic resolution scaling and 30 FPS caps, but we're easily 2x faster here. Let's talk Unreal Engine 5 now, and this one is kind of controversial, right? Because generally speaking, these games are heavy. That's what stuff like uh, Lumen, Nanite, and Virtual Shadow Maps means. Next-gen fidelity comes at a cost, and we were warned about this. Going back to the Matrix Awakens demo, you can see that the engine was built with upscaling in mind. Epic literally advertising the fact in the code here by showing its own TSR technology in action alongside all of its other innovations. Not bad, TSR is pretty good, but DLSS is better. And let's kick off by looking at Fortnite Unreal Engine 5, a 60 FPS experience on PS5 with dynamic resolution scaling in place and TSR upscaling. I've matched settings here, effectively a mixture of high and epic, but I've swapped in DLSS and stuck to performance upscaling at 4K and balanced upscaling at 1440p. Averaged across the replay here, 4K outputs delivering 112 frames per second, uh, rising to a remarkable 152 frames per second at 1440p. So VRR uh, working in combination with a 4K 120 or a 1440p 144Hz screen is going to look pretty good. I also wanted to check out Immortals of Avium, here running fully maxed out, again with 4K in DLSS performance mode, 1440p at DLSS balanced. So the reason I chose this one is that PS5 kind of struggles here in terms of upscaling quality and in locking to its target 60 frames per second. 4070 Super just blasts through the game. The real-time 3D intro to the third chapter is very taxing on the GPU, more so than most gameplay, so I thought I'd bench it. Frame rate in this sequence, 73 FPS average at 4K DLSS performance mode, rising to 95 frames per second if you engage frame gen on top of that. 1440p in DLSS balanced sees a 99 FPS average, rising to a remarkable 145 FPS with frame gen added. So we've seen a lot of comments about upscaling being used as a crutch, but the point is that it's equally viable as an enabler of new technologies. Unreal Engine 5 would not have rolled out without it. You can take a view on frame generation and its positives and negatives, but upscaling is here to stay. If you want to see upscaling as a crutch, check out The Last of Us Part 1. Um, we've got a pretty much 100% lock on console equivalent settings here, and we're stacking up the RTX 4070 Super against the PlayStation 5 in its fidelity mode with a 40 FPS cap for 120 Hz TVs, uh, we can actually find the limits of the engine and stack up those scenes against the PC. Something's clearly up with this port still. 
I measured just a 36% uplift to performance at native 4K against the console. And yeah, basically at this point, it does require DLSS quality mode to get you within sniffing distance of the two times performance multiplier we've taken for granted thus far. Going to end with the Plague Tale Requiem, and similar to The Last of Us, we can use the PlayStation 5's fidelity mode in a 120Hz container to find areas where the game can't sustain its target 40fps cap. In match settings, using a Sobos upscaler with a 2160p output from a 1440p input, there's a 1.96 times like for like increase, moving from PS5 to 4070 Super, very similar when it comes to the results offered up by the DLSS quality mode. Frame generation is available in this game too, and our test scene offered up a 2.5x increase in frame rate over the console. That's closer to what we'd expect a $600 GPU to be really. Doubling console performance really is a baseline, but as I hope you can see from my various testing here, once you start factoring in things like path tracing, ray reconstruction, DLSS upscaling, the experience becomes greater than the sum of its parts. While frame generation is a very useful tool when high refresh rate monitors are so prevalent in the PC space. Okay, so that's the end of the video then. Like, subscribe, share on the off chance that you did like it and did find it useful and yeah, ring the bell for things. Things that may well take the form of notifications that may arrive in some kind of short-term timescale, no guarantees there. Uh, DF supporter program though, join us for early access, the ability to contribute to DF Direct Weekly, early access to DF Direct Weekly, high quality video downloads, bonus materials, and a whole lot more. Honestly, we couldn't do it without you. Your support is crucial. Oh, and just a little reminder here for store.digitalfoundry.net where you shall find a range of appealing merchandise. But that's all from me on this one. Thanks for watching and supporting Digital Foundry.